Amen. How many grateful to be in the house of God on a Wednesday? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Grateful for the Spirit of God as you wait. Why don't you turn around and tell two or three people just how much you love Jesus. All right. Amen. Thank you, music team. Did a wonderful job. They're just jamming out up here, huh? My goodness. David Barone on the drums, ladies and gentlemen. He does it all, ladies. He does it all. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thankful for what the Lord uh, is doing and has done. Um, I'm expecting uh, great things tonight. Feeling some direction in my spirit. Amen. And uh, as we've already been culminating over the past four services is uh, God gave me a, a series and tonight's the last installment of that series and it was designed to encourage us uh, that even in an overindulgent dopamine saturated society that it's still the will of God that we're addicted to nothing can I get an amen, amen. To remind us that the power of the cross and the power of the Holy Ghost are able to set us free from any chain, regardless of the strength or length of that chain. And we have to be watchful uh, for things creeping into our lives that can slowly ease us into a cycle that we can sometimes find it hard to get out of. And Satan doesn't mind if you're addicted to something just as you're just as long as you're addicted to something and I'm gonna review a bit last week uh, last week uh, really uh, was a very special week the Holy Ghost really broke out in a very significant way and I really didn't get to preach the message how I felt to preach it or rather uh, the things I felt to say I, I felt like there was a witness of the spirit I just kind of put the mic down and and uh, the Lord did his thing. And so I kind of wrestled a bit whether I should actually preach that message tonight or uh, just review. I'm just going to review some of the main points. Some of them I was unable to say, but it'll help build for where I feel the Lord wants us to go tonight. And uh, I, I attempted to describe the source of why I believe addictions are so common in our society. Um, and if you remember, the Lord really... Uh, showed up in a very real way, but I'll, I'll try to real, recap some of the points uh, that I wasn't able to say last week. And it all started, last week's message all started with the phrase that an old acquaintance once said uh, to excuse his alcoholic lifestyle. And he said this phrase, that everybody has their vice. And it kind of sent me on a, a spiral, but uh, what he was trying to say is that everybody needs an escape. Everybody needs that escape from the stress and the pain and all of the, the trials of life, even if that escape is not good for you. And I believe that it's in these moments that we truly realize our humanity. It's those eye-opening moments where you can't take any more that you realize how inadequate we really are. It's in these moments of inadequacy that we search for outlets that help us find greater fulfillment. We reach for something greater than ourselves. But in actuality, these moments are really designed to point to our need for Jesus in our life. They're realization moments, they're eye-opening moments that by myself, I truly am not enough. But instead, we stuff literally God only knows what into our soul, trying to fill that void. And these, when these vices don't work, we, we try more and more and more and more and more and more and more until we find ourselves literally, physically dependent on these vices. And But if you've ever really experienced the presence of God, like we did last week, you know that there really isn't anything that could fill that void like the Lord Jesus can. The scripture teaches us that humanity was created for the pleasure of God. 
We are designed. It is in our very DNA to connect with our creator. And when you begin to talk and walk with Jesus, you start to finally grasp insight into why you were created. All of your unanswerable questions find their answer. And that empty, voided space starts to fill up. The old timers used to say it like this, can't nobody do me like Jesus, amen. And I know my introduction sounds a little bit like an altar call today, amen. But I, I felt it necessary to relay the foundation to help us go where we're going uh, tonight. And I've learned that truly the best way to fight an addiction is to replace it with another one. Replace it with the right one. Replace it with the thing that your soul really is longing for. And I've learned that addictions can be progressive. You start with a little hit. You start with just one moment and it grows. Well, it's the same thing with your walk with God. It starts with an altar experience on a Wednesday. And then you go Wednesday to Wednesday. And you know what? After a while, you start to say, I can't wait until next Wednesday. I need to get a little bit of this on Thursday. And you know what? I need a little bit of what I felt on Wednesday night on Friday as well. And I need a little bit of that on Saturday and on Monday and on Tuesday. And then it just doesn't do it in the morning anymore. Then you got to get a little bit of it in the afternoon and the evening. And all of a sudden you start walking with Jesus and you don't leave him at church anymore. But you feel his presence everywhere you go. Friend, I want to tell you right now, that's what your soul is longing for. Come on, no addiction, no substance, no alcohol, no drugs will ever, no person will be able to fill that void like the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And so uh, I'm here to talk about that last phase of overcoming those addictions because I, I mentioned last week that repentance is not just stopping the bad thing, but you have to replace it with a good thing. And so we talked about last week when you actively engage the presence of God, David said, for thy loving kindness is better than life. You know what he's saying? Of all the experiences that I could ever engage in, there is nothing quite like the glory of God that I feel in the sanctuary of God. And so it's important. And so if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me after my very long introduction to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, starting with verse 13. We're going to read three verses. When you have it, would you shout amen? Amen. The word of the Lord reads, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. All the men say, be strong. Be strong. Let all your things be done with charity. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia. And listen to what the King James Version says. And that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. That ye submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth with, with us and laboreth. With the help of the Lord, I want to talk to you about addicted to the ministry. Addicted to the ministry. Would you put your Bible down, lift your hands where you're seated right now. Would you just open up your heart to the word of the Lord. In the name of Jesus. Father, I feel such a witness of the presence of God. I felt the music team saying the perfect songs that needed to be sung tonight. We feel your presence here. We feel great unity and hunger in the house of God tonight. Lord, I pray by the end of this service, you'd fill somebody with the Holy Ghost. Lord, I pray that someone would get the revelation that you have got a plan for their life. Father, I could not articulate this as well as it needs to be articulated. I need the witness of the Spirit. I need the amen of the Holy Ghost to shadow, overshadow this building tonight 
help someone to realize that they have a purpose for their life. We love you, Lord. Would you clap your hands unto the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Appreciate you. And uh, as was mentioned in the very first lesson, uh, that there were two predominant, we're reading through the Corinthians, there were two predominant worldviews that shaped much of the mindsets of the world around the Corinthian church. And these weren't doctrines or religions per se, but they were philosophical paradigms in which many religions or doctrines would form. And one we mentioned was called asceticism. And it's this doctrine that taught the necessity of severe self-discipline, disciplining your body, and the avoidance of all forms of indulgence or pleasure. And this would cause a person to spiritually ascend if you can uh, relegate yourself to severe disciplines. And this still exists in many types of Buddhism today, that they, they, they neglect all of their self-desires, they detach themselves from the world, and they experience something called nirvana, that is the doctrines of Buddhism, some of some sects of Buddhism. But the second uh, group was, we're going to spend a lot of time tonight talking about this group, because it's a very prevalent group in our society today. So I want you to get very familiar with the term and hearing the term. The second is called hedonism, and hedonism is the doctrine. Everyone needs to understand this for where we're going. That pleasure or happiness was the sole and chief good in life. That the point of life was to have pleasure and to be happy. And as I will describe later in the message, but hedonism has been around for millennia. And it thoroughly has been debunked in every single generation as a meaningful way of life. Yet it seems to resurface again in every generation. And today it's resurfaced in a very real way. And honestly, we are so saturated with these ideas of hedonism. That pleasure is the ultimate goal that it is ridiculous to even point out sometimes. Uh, I asked Sister Lupita to track some uh, pictures down for me. She did a great job. Uh, some companies you might be familiar with. Um, their, their billboards are really everywhere, and they promote this doctrine. The first is one that we're familiar with is Coca-Cola. The slogan of Coca-Cola is, taste the feeling. It's not that drinking Coca-Cola is just about quenching your thirst, but it's about a positive, pleasurable experience. I don't just drink a Coke when I'm thirsty. I drink a Coke to have a euphoric experience. There's another one I think we looked up. You go to the next one. Open happiness. You know, I've really been looking for happiness in my life. So I went down to the 7-Eleven and I bought a $2.79 Coca-Cola. And I opened it and all of a sudden all my problems were solved. How stupid do they think people really are, honestly? But it just becomes so much part of the backdrop that we don't even think about it. How silly would it be to buy a Coca-Cola and you literally open happiness? The next one, L'Oreal Paris. Some of the ladies know what I'm talking about. There's nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with being clean. Amen. Because you're worth it. Because there's something about, you know, having the right hair care products that makes you more valuable of a person. There's something about just buying the high-end hair products that somewhere it's going gonna, it's gonna to make you feel better about life. It's going to improve your, your sense of self-worth. McDonald's, we can all say that one without looking. Can someone shout it out? I'm loving it. As if the term of the most powerful emotion that has ever encountered mankind really belongs upon a double cheeseburger. Some of y'all are like, I don't know, you know. I'm loving it. I got me a, I got me a double quarter pounder and I found the love of my life. Someone's going to clip that out of context. I know you are. Better not. Dan's already said it. Amen. But, but it's, it's a simple yet powerful slogan. It emphasizes the enjoyment and pleasure you're going to experience by getting an overpriced hamburger. And then there's KFC. Oh, this is a good one. Finger licking good. 
You know what I thought was so funny? I looked up this slogan today and they actually suspended the slogan during COVID because they're afraid people are gonna get COVID after they eat their chicken, you know? Finger licking good, it's so good. I don't even wanna put it down. Oh, this, this drumstick is so delicious. I just wanna savor every bite with every morsel of every crumb. And it, it goes into the realm of foolishness. We're laughing, why are we laughing? Because it's so foolish, yet we look at this stuff around us every single day. And we don't realize how it subconsciously impacts how we view the world. These are not even the worst ones. How many love ice cream? Anybody love ice cream? Anybody love haagen -Dazs? Any bougie people, you like the real stuff, haagen -Dazs. Well, haagen -Dazs has got this crazy slogan Pleasure is the path to joy. What in the world is that doing on the front of an ice cream bottle? I mean, that is about the most supercharged philosophical phrase I've ever heard in my life. Pleasure is the path to joy. It's all around us. Dove chocolate says this. It says when you want to pick up a dove chocolate piece of chocolate, you need to choose pleasure. You know, and that Dove Chocolate's got some crazy ones, you know? I read one today, it said in the inside of their wrapping, it says, addiction is fun, but giving in is funner. That's what it says, look it up. Satan's in your chocolate, come on somebody. I'm being a little bit humorous, but I'm pointing out the obvious. It's all around us. Do what makes you happy. Do what feels good in the moment. Do, do that momentary pleasure. Nobody's watching. It's going to be okay. It's all in our society. It covers our society. And what about Las Vegas? Anybody know what the slogan of Las Vegas is? What happens here stays here. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But you know what? That really isn't true. When you come back with a drug habit and you come back... With, with an STD or you come back with, with thousands of dollars in gambling debt, that doesn't really just stay in Las Vegas, does it? But if I can just convince you to engage in this pleasure without meditating on any of the consequences, then the devil can truly have his way, can he? And these aren't just company slogans. They really are the backdrop of our everyday life. Common phrases you hear every day. Live for the moment. Do what feels good in the moment. And what about this one? Yo, low. You only live once. Uh, uh, well, you need to ask Lazarus if that's true. Amen. Uh, and ultimately, you need to ask Jesus if it's true. Because he died and he was resurrected again. And the Bible says, we're going to be resurrected again. And either you're going to go to heaven or you're going to go somewhere else. So truly, you don't just live once. You live once on this earth. And what you do on this earth is going to determine what you do in the next life. But if Satan gets you so caught up in what's important in this life, he'll get you to miss what's important in the next life. If it feels good, do it. Do it if it feels good. Does it feel good? Then do it. Even in our Constitution, we are given three unalienable rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of Happiness, as if it is the, the most important thing, is just happiness. I remember uh, I was intrigued preparing for this message, and I got an AI, and I asked it the question. It wasn't ChatGBT, it was another one, and I asked it, what is the purpose for life? Just curious what it would say. What is the purpose for life? And it responded to me in a very harm, uh, in a very frightening way. Because I know that this generation is going to begin to rely on AI, already is, but will rely on AI more and more and more. It's very important that you have a good source for where you get your answers for life. And this AI said, what's the purpose for life? It said, without hesitation, as it so often does, there is no purpose for life. Oh, it said, some say, there is no purpose for life. And every person has to try to find their own meaning and purpose for their life. They have to do what makes them happy, in other words. But I've learned that we live in a generation that life is more dangerous than it's ever been before. But it's not dangerous for the reasons you might first assume. It's not because there's imminent 
torrential dangers around us. But life is dangerous simply because life is boring. We get ourselves into so much trouble because we purposely wander around life just looking for something to do. We can literally, in the comfort of our own home, never change out of our pajamas, live a fully sustained life through meal deliveries and Amazon deliveries and Instacart deliveries and all the things that we need to do. We can sign up for the DMV online and we can file our taxes online and we never have to leave the front door of our house and life is more dangerous because of it. When you have no purpose, you have no direction. And if you wander around long enough, you're going to find yourself in a pit that you were never intending to find. And how many can, under, can resonate and know that the internet is a very fitting example of this? Beyond the internet, no reason to be on. We're just, we have nothing else to do. So we pull out our phone or our laptop and we just kill time scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. But if you scroll long enough, you're going to find something you weren't looking for. And you're going to find yourself in a pit you didn't intend to be in. And it all started with this thing called boredom. How many knows that boredom and anxiety can actually be very closely related? I want you to understand something. And this was told to me and it's changed the way I look at life. To be truly bored, I understand we say it just in passing. But to be truly bored is a terrifying thing. To say that you are bored in life. Is a terrifying thing because what you're saying is, is that there's nothing meaningful left in life. There's nothing meaningful left for me to do. We don't say in my house, my kids, they don't say, they're not allowed to say that they're bored. They say that they're bored, I'll, I'll give you something to do, you know. They pick it up at school or something. But we don't say that we're bored in our house because to constantly say that you're bored is an indication that you are living a life without purpose. Or you need constant stimulation because the thoughts of your mind are, are, are so hard to deal with. You constantly need stimu stimulation to protect you against your own thoughts. And so we live life just going from the next exciting experience to another. And everything in between is quite dull. We live from one thrill to the next. We hop from one conference to the next. We, 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 one major experience, birthday parties, whatever it might be, and everything in between we're just trying to get through. We work like a slave on our job so we can get that $1 an hour raise just so we can spend it on more stuff. I, I mentioned earlier that hedonism or this idea that life is all about doing and, and, and living what makes you happy it's been proven to be a horrible way of finding actual fulfillment because if you do what is momentary pleasurable, you are setting up yourself for long-term pain. And uh, the wise man Solomon takes it even a step further. In Ecclesiastes 2, 24 through 26, Solomon says this, Nothing is better for a man that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. Solomon said there's nothing wrong with enjoying a good meal. And I want to emphasize there's nothing wrong with enjoying life. There's nothing wrong with enjoying a good beverage. There's nothing wrong with having uh, good friends and good fellowship and, and enjoying the nature. There's nothing wrong with any of that. Solomon says, I really learned that this was from the hand of God. God created the world, so we're not, uh, we don't ascribe to this doctrine of asceticism to where uh, we can't have any enjoyment in life or any pleasure in life whatsoever. That's not what I'm talking about. God created your taste buds in your mouth so you could enjoy food. Amen. And God created you to enjoy spending time with your friends and, and hanging out. Those are all wonderful and appropriate things. What I am talking about is when your life has no direction and all you seek is pleasurable experiences. He goes on to say, for who can eat? Or who can have enjoyment more than I? 
You know what Solomon is saying? Solomon was the wisest king and the richest king to have ever lived. There's never been a nation or kingdom that has ever existed up to this point that could rival the wealth and the splendor of Solomon's kingdom. Solomon had everything. Anything he wanted to eat, it was at his table. Gold, jewelry, fine silver, servants. They were all at his disposal. There was never a kingdom that had as much as Solomon's kingdom. And he said, there's nobody that's had better food. And there's nobody that's drank better beverages. Why do I still feel so empty at the end of the day? In verse 26, he says, for God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner, he gives the work of the gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. And then he uses this phrase that he uses throughout the book. This is also vanity and grasping for the wind. Solomon said, you have to understand that Solomon is in a backslidden state at this point. He's not living for God and he's reflecting on those years where he left God and all of the wealth and the splendor and he really isn't giving advice as a man that is walking with God but somebody who has seen it all and done it all and Ecclesiastes is hopefully Solomon making his way back to God we hope this is his book of repentance that's what we hope for but we don't have any evidence for that but what he realized in his backslidden state is that everything at the end of the day is vanity he says, I've had the best food. I've had the best experiences. I've done the pleasure thing. I've experienced physical human pleasure. There is no human being on the face of the earth that has experienced pleasure to the depths that Solomon has experienced pleasure. And he said, at the end of the day, when my heart was turned away from God, I realized that it's still empty and it's still vain. And we could never experience all the things that Solomon experiences. But there's this persuasive thought that's given by society and by marketing that if I could just have the right stuff, if I could just drive the right car, if I could just live in that nice house, if I could just really live uh, with that paycheck or, or doing that job, then at the end of the day, I'm going to be happy and I'm going to find fulfillment. But the unfortunate thing is Solomon already went down that path and he, he experienced that and he said at the end of the day, it truly is just empty. He says, for God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man. I've learned that there are people that they don't live high status lifestyles. They don't live in the nicest neighborhoods. They don't wear the nicest shoes. But you know what? They found their way into the presence of God. And those people have demonstrated more joy and more fulfillment and more purpose in life than any man that's living on Wall Street. Why is it that the Wall Street billionaires and the movie stars and the rock stars and the Michael Jan Jacksons and the Pamela Andersons of the world. They have everything that life could ever offer but yet they still in a moment take their own life because they find emptiness. They thought they were going to get everything. They thought the things were going to make them happy but at the end of the day they did not. And so this idea of hedonism and just Chasing the next pleasurable moment, it really leads down a path of destruction. And this is why Paul tells Timothy, he says, there's going to be, and we, we visited this verse at the beginning of the series. He said, but there's going to be in the last days men that rise up among the church. And perilous times are going to come and men are going to be lovers of themselves. To us, that sounds so Normal. It sounds so customary. Uh, you got to love yourself. And if you don't love yourself, you're not going to do anything. And, and it's the Disney mantra for life. Just, just love yourself. Just be yourself. Just do whatever makes you happy. He said there's going to be lovers of money, boasters, proud, so on and so forth. And in the last verse, he says they're going to be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And to me, there seems to be an impossible connection between an individual that simultaneously chases pleasure and chases God. The Apostle Peter gave, came to grips with this in his own life. Only a few days after his greatest failure to date, when he denied having any part of Jesus, only hours before he was crucified, Jesus now asks him three times the same redemptive question. Peter, I know you denied me three times, 
but Peter, do you love me? I know in the moment, because we've got to get some stuff straight, Peter, because in the moment, you were worried about what made you feel comfortable. You were worried about not experiencing those comfortable moments. But sometimes, Peter, you're going to be put in a very uncomfortable situation where you have to either choose loving me or loving your flesh. And so he said, Peter, we, we've got to get some stuff straight now. Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, oh, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus asked him a second time, but Peter, really, 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 do you love me? And, and, and Peter, really, 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 I love you. And then a third time, Jesus asks again and said, but Peter, do you really love me? And the Bible says that Peter became distraught. And he says, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus responds, Peter, if you love me, then feed my lambs. What Jesus was saying is, Peter, you cannot love me if you don't love my lambs. When you become affectionate with me, Peter, you begin to love the things that I love. You, become, you begin to become compassionate about the people that I'm compassionate about. You know, there's something about spending time in the presence of God that really begins to redirect your purpose for living. You know, there might have been a day where I was a paper chaser. There might have been a day where all I did was live for the next high and live for a better job and, and live for a better car. But you know what? I, I found myself in a relationship with a man named Jesus. And all of a sudden, my priorities started to shift. I've learned that when you spend time in the presence of God, you start to find purpose for your life. And the issue why we get into so much trouble and we, and we fall into these addictions is because we are not aware that Jesus has a purpose for our life. That yes, you are designed to walk with him in the cool of the day. But God and, and Adam had an understanding. After we get done walking in the cool of the day, I need you to tend to this garden that I created. Because you can't love me if you don't love my work. A love for God always produces a love for his work. And in Hebrews 6, chapter 10. Excuse me, Hebrews 6, verse 10. They can throw it up on the screen. The Bible says, for God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown towards his name in that you have ministered to the saints uh, and do minister. What the writer is saying uh, is God looks down at, that, at the work you do and he realizes that you're not just doing it to stay busy, but this is something that precipitated uh, out of a love for Jesus Christ. Uh, you know why I minister to the saints uh, and you don't want to know why I do what I do uh, because I love him so much. Uh, and when I love him so much, I start to love his people so much. I'm telling you, I'm not up here preaching uh, and doing ministry because this is uh, my ambition or what I want to do. Uh, these are the things the Lord Jesus has asked me to do. Uh, and when you get in the presence of God, uh, I'm telling you, I, got, I want someone to hear me right now. And you get in the presence of God and you start praying. And like we were talking about what we felt last week, you start to feel the glory of God and, and you start to entertain his presence. But somewhere in that prayer meeting, you start to pick up on the heartbeat of God. Because the Bible says that when we, we look at him, we become like him. The more time you spend with him, the more you start acting like him. The more you start loving and the more you start caring and the more compassionate you get and the more passionate you get and the more long suffering you get. And you might have walked in with a bad, bad attitude, but you walk out with a purpose for living. And I'm telling you, there are so many young adults that were just chasing the next pleasurable experience in life. We're just working to get better jobs, to get better pay, to buy nicer things. But I want to tell you that there is so much more that God has planned for your life. I, I believe it. 
The Bible says that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. And the title of my message uh, is Addicted to Ministry. There was these people that Paul observed. Uh, they got so much in the work of God. Uh, and they got so involved in the work of God uh, that it didn't just seem like involvement anymore. Uh, they started to, to minister to the saints. But it started to be kind of an obsessive thing where they, they, they couldn't stop ministering. People didn't have to get on them to come to church. People didn't have to get on them to go knock doors. They didn't have to wait uh, until a church outreach or to a campus ministry event, which I'm appreciative for. But there's something about just tasting uh, of the goodness of God uh, that causes you to want to share it with everybody else. Uh, and there's people that try to separate relationship and ministry. We hear this all the time. Like they're, they're two different chasms with God. But truly, when you spend time in relationship, the most natural thing in the world uh, is to leave that prayer meeting with a desire to minister to other people. And it's the will of God that you leave this prayer meeting we're going to have, and, and over the next couple of days, you're going to start to realize that God genuinely has a purpose for my life. We talk about the ministry of reconciliation. It, it, it truly is an addicting thing if you've ever experienced it. If you've ever experienced somebody that's fallen into sin, if you've ever experienced somebody that was wayward, and they lost their way with God and you got yourself involved in their life and you started to minister to them and you started to pray for them and you maybe went on a little fast for them and you would send them morning devotional scriptures and you would encourage them and you would do everything you could to share your spirit with them and to watch that person literally hanging over the cusp of hell dangling their feet over the fire as Peter said there's something about when you see that person Come back to the house of God and start living for God again and start walking with God again. Friend, there really is something addicting about that. And you got to get involved in the work of God. And when you see the work of God start to manifest and you start to see the power of God demonstrated, I'm telling you, you may have never won a soul before. But let me tell you, when you do, it is an addicting experience. When you see that coworker you've been praying for, that you, you've been bringing up in class, I want to pray for my coworker. You see them come to the house of God, lift up their hands, get filled with the Holy Ghost. Friend, I want to tell you, you are hooked. You are hooked. I don't just want to see one do it. I don't just want to, I want to see everybody I can because I know the gospel works. I know the gospel works. But some of you got to get your hands in the harvest. You've got to get out of this prayer meeting and go do something for the kingdom of God. You gotta stop wandering through life with no purpose. You gotta stop wandering through life just, just trying to find the next experience and say, Jesus, what do you want me to do today? There's a prayer I used to pray, God, I prayed my heart would break for what your heart breaks for. I was taught that prayer as a kid, and I started to pray that prayer uh, religiously. But you know what? There's a danger in praying that prayer, Daniel, because you'll be driving down the streets of Stockton, uh, and all of a sudden you'll start crying, and you don't know why you're crying. And, and you'll look at a homeless man on the street, and you usually just pass him by. You usually wouldn't give him another thought, but you prayed that prayer, Lord, I want my heart to break for what your heart breaks for. And all of a sudden you got to pull over on the side of the road and you got to get out in, into the ghetto of Stockton and get out of the comfort of your car and say something is driving me to do something something is driving me I've got a purpose I've got to reach somebody I've got to tell everybody just how good Jesus is have you heard about how good Jesus is he changed my life he changed my life and you don't know what to preach you don't know what to preach the Apostle John said we just preach what we've seen and, and heard he said, we just preach what we've seen and heard. Just tell them your testimony. Just tell them where God brought you from. I used to be addicted. I used to be so full of anxiety. I don't know all the scriptures like my pastor does. And, and I'm learning them. I'm trying to learn them. But let me tell you about what God did for me. He took me. I was full of depression. And, and, I, and I was full of fear. And I couldn't get my life together. But he put my fear. I don't want just. I don't want this experience just to stop with me. I want everybody whom I've ever met to get what I've got and you've got to leave with a sense of purpose uh, quit just trying to just wander wander scroll your way through life you gotta 
find a purpose where the scrolling doesn't do it for you anymore. But there's something I have to do. I'm telling you, when you see firsthand how the gospel works, it is addicting. I remember the first time I ever saw a supernatural healing with my own hands. I saw some as a kid that happened from other ministers. I was an, I was an observer. But I remember the first time I saw someone supernaturally healed. It was my freshman year of Bible school. Actually, it was my senior year of high school. The story, the story started. It was in this gymnasium. I've been having church in this gymnasium a long time. Amen. And it was in this gymnasium. It was a youth service back then. And we had a special guest preacher who was talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And he said, how many of you feel like you're called to the gift of healing? And uh, I didn't really know, but I thought that was cool. So I, I went down, you know. That sounds like, I, if you're giving out free, you know, healing gifts, then I'm coming, you know. I'm serious. I, I, I came down. And I remember uh, Sister Raquel Montantes, her mom came down too. And I, I've told this story a few times. And, and uh, we, we stood next to each other. And uh, there was a young man that came down. And uh, he had these, I just call them Coke bottle glasses, if you get the illustration. Like, they almost look like x-ray vision. You know what I mean? Like, I felt like he could see through clothes or something, you know? He had these thick old glasses, and he couldn't see very well. And there used to be a clock up there. Anybody remember that old clock back there, you know? And uh, he, was, he was about right here. I can almost remember the spot. He was about right here. And we were praying for him. And, and as a test, we looked back and said, can you see that clock back there? And he squinted like, you know, they do. And he, he couldn't see the clock. And, and we said, hey, bro, if we pray for you, do you believe God's going to heal you? The preacher actually came up and asked him. And he said, uh, I'll never forget what he said. He said, you know, I feel like God can, but God may be a little bit busy right now. So he said, and he said, I don't know if he really wants to, but I know that he can. And we prayed for him. And uh, Shocking, nothing happened. Nothing happened. And I remember it was about a year later. I was now a freshman in Bible school, and we we're at the West Lane campus. And I remember this person, his life got transformed in Bible college. I mean, God completely changed his life. He, he became, uh, from that lukewarm person, he became so on fire for God. And I was in that service, and my memory got, got stirred. And I remember us praying that prayer. And I went to him, and I called him by name. And I said, Bro, you remember we prayed that prayer about a year ago? He said, I remember. And you didn't believe God could heal you then? He says, I remember. I said, you believe God can heal you now? He said, without, without any hesitation at all, absolutely, I believe it. God can heal me right now. So I called Sister Lisa. And I said, Sister Lisa, because she prayed with me before, I'm going to put the phone to his right ear. You're going to pray for the right eye. And I'm going to lay my hand on the left eye, and we're going to pray. And we're going to believe God's going to heal him. I mean, he couldn't see a few feet in front of him. He was, he was almost legally blind. Couldn't even drive a car. He could barely see at all. And I remember we laid our hands on him and we began to pray. And I, and I just prayed with all the faith I had in me. And we, we removed our hands. And I asked him, how do you feel? And Brother Zoe, just like that woman you experienced, uh, he started, it was like a moment. He started to blink his eyes. Uh, and he looked around the room like he had seen the world for the first time. Uh, and he said, oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness. And, and he starts to look around and he starts noticing that there's signs on the wall he never noticed before. Where did that sign come from? I've never seen that sign before. And, and, and he starts to realize, and I remember I grabbed my Bible and I, I held it like, like a foot or so back like this. And it was little King James print Bible. And he started to read without glasses every single word. And I remember the, the, the revelation came on him and he started to realize, oh my gosh. He started running around the building, screaming at the top of, of his lungs, Jesus healed my eyes. Jesus healed my eyes. Jesus healed my eyes. I'll never forget. I walked up to him. He had these expensive glasses. I said, bro, where are your glasses at? We could use this as like a, a testimony. He said, half of them are over there and the other half are over there. I don't need them anymore. Jesus healed my eyes. I'm going to tell you, I've never stopped praying for people. I don't care who's not healed. I know he's a healer. And I'm going to keep praying uh, until every person I pray for is healed. Uh, because I know he is a healer. You've got to get out. You've got to do it. You've got to pray. You've got to lay hands. You've got to say it works. It works. It works. It works. These signs shall follow them that believe. 
Sister Angela's interpreting right now. She's in my Signs and Wonders class. And uh, every day, I told them, I said, I want you to look for a miracle. Every day, I want you to look for a miracle. And she says, okay. And she sets a timer on her phone. Every day at 5.02, it goes off, and it says, look for a miracle. And she asks everybody that's around her at that moment, do you, meet, do you need a miracle? I see Shay smiling right now. She was, one, she was one of those miracles. And over the past two weeks, uh, Angela has seen uh, uh, how many? Six or how many? That was two fingers. Six? Oh, six. Okay, I didn't, I didn't know some Alaska terminology, you know? <laughs> six. Okay. In the last couple of weeks, she's seen six people supernaturally healed and you can see it all over her she's hooked she wants to pray for everybody she wants to lay her hands on everybody because when you feel the power of god for the first time you might have not felt it now you might have not felt it now but when it happens when it happens when it happens you'll never forget you'll never forget you'll never forget he's a healer he's a healer you'll tell everybody he's a healer You've got to find purpose. You've got to realize that this book works, uh, that God changes lives. And if you don't have a purpose for your life, you're just going to keep falling into pits over and over again. And it says that labor of love, the more time you spend with Jesus, the more passionate you get about his children and about his work. I've got to tell everybody about this. Watch what happens when you get out of the prayer room and into the harvest field, how your priorities start to shift in your life. Now my job isn't so begrudging anymore. It's become a harvest field. Whew, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Now my $15 an hour job with my annoying manager isn't so hard anymore because every single day I go to work I go to a harvest field I go where there's people that are lost I go where there's people that need to hear the gospel I'm not worried about the hourly wage anymore I'm not worried about getting promoted as much as I was anymore I'm worried about doing something I hope someone gets saved today I'm telling you I've never been at a job I've never been at a job where I didn't at least lay hands on somebody someone was healed or someone got the Holy Ghost I've been on the clock and people have gotten the Holy Ghost. I've had three people get the Holy Ghost while I was on the clock. I've had dozens of other managers stayed in, stayed in touch with my life. I taught them a Bible study. They got filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, you have to start looking at your life in a different lens. God, why did you place me here? Why am I in these group of, why, why am I among this group of people? And when your life starts to get connected to your purpose, you start to feel fulfillment like you've never felt in your life. The first time you've seen somebody, I talk about her all the time, Sister Chelsea. Wave your hand, Sister Chelsea. First time you see someone delivered from anxiety. I'm talking about crippling anxiety. I'm not talking about they're just a little bit nervous. Uh, I'm talking about they can't function without having to take prescription medication. And they shake and they tremble. And, and Sister Chelsea, can, she can come up here and tell her testimony. She's not ashamed. I, I tell it all the time because I saw what God did in her life. And, and she couldn't, before she came to God, really she lived a denominal life. She, before she came to the truth, rather, uh, if she even had to think about bills or or anything like that. She had to pull over on the side of the road because it would cause her to be such anxiety. The doctors and her family told her, you are going to take this prescription anxiety medication for the rest of your life. Uh, but one day, Brother Ronnie and Brother Vince, uh, Brother Vince wasn't here yet. She invited Brother Vince. Brother Ronnie invited her to church and she came to church uh, and she was baptized in Jesus' name and she got filled with the Holy Ghost and she's never had to take another anxiety pill ever again. She flushed them down the toilet when you see that friend you get addicted I want everyone to get this I want everyone to see this because it works the power of the gospel works <laughs> pastor Vince come on up here pastor Vince I didn't plan on it because I didn't know you're gonna be here but then sister Chelsea and brother Ronnie invited pastor Vince to church and I don't think he minds me saying it this boy used to cuss like a sailor can I tell him the whole story or half of it. He used to, I mean, just smoke weed every weekend. No purpose for his life. Wandering aimlessly, full of sadness. But he came to a, he came to a, what kind of drama was it? It was a Christmas drama. He came to a Christmas drama one night. 
and, and, and God, he, he got the Holy Ghost when he was a little boy, but God refilled him with the Holy Ghost that night, and I baptized him in Jesus' name that night. And Brother Vince is the most full of integrity, honorable, loving, Holy Ghost-filled man that I personally have the knowledge, uh, uh, the, 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 the privilege of knowing, but I saw it happen. So how many of your coworkers can be a pastor of it? Pastors are elders ministry now. He pastors one of the most important ministries. Gonna, gonna be teaching that a Bible school. Just a few years ago, he was just another drug addicted coworker. But the power of the gospel works. And listen, the reason you feel so empty is you're not doing anything for the kingdom. When you see a Brian, come on up, Brian. We're just testifying tonight. Is that all right? Remember, whew, I'll get crying talking about this boy. I remember little Brian Villatoro came. Josmar invited him, and he came, and he had, he had his hair was about here then, and his mustache was about here then, and he had shorts about here, and he didn't really pray the first five or six services, but he did stay after play a little basketball with us, you know, and and, and Brian was just around, just hanging out, just another visitor. And, and then the God, Brother Ronnie, your member started working on Brian. And, and he, he started, I asked him if this was okay. He said it was okay. He started to struggle with all the things he used to do and, and all the condemnation that came. And there were three services in particular where Brian was on that front row and ran out the door. And I had to run my fat self out to grab him. <laughs> Wheezing the whole way, you know. Had to grab him. <laughs> And we're out there, and he said, I'm leaving, I'm never coming back. And we, we'd sat in that locker room, and we talked for like an hour or two. I missed the rest of the service. I wasn't preaching that night. And we talked, and he said, okay, I'll come back one more time. And it happened another time. And then it happened another time, and Jordan texted me. He said, Brian just left again, Pastor Morgan. And so I ran out to go grab him. And, to, and I said, Brian, you got to sit with me. So Brian sat with me the whole service. And just like a mama, you know, I grabbed him next to me, and I prayed for him. I shook him, you know, and... And, and I just, I wasn't giving up on this boy. But then all of a sudden, it, the momentum started to build. And God filled him with the Holy Ghost. And he got baptized. I baptized him. And he just literally floated out of the water. I'm telling you. I had to hold his head up. Because he was just literally floating in the water. Had, and the, a service does not go by where Brian doesn't cry in a service. It just doesn't go by. And I watched him last week. We had all these visitors back here. We had like five or six visitors. And this guy that I used to have to go grab and bring back into service had his Bible open and was pointing to scriptures to him and say, you got to be baptized in Jesus' name. This is, how, this is how God did it for me. And they're sitting there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then he, then he hops over to this guy over here and starts, and then he's praying with him in the altar. When you see what God can do for a Brian Villatoro, I'm telling you, it just puts something in you. I am addicted to this. I'm addicted to seeing people's lives change. I want to see more lives change. I'm not done with one. I'm not done with one. I'm not done with ten. I'm not done with a hundred. I'm addicted to it. I'm addicted to it. I've got to see it. I'm not going to stop until I see every young adult in Stockton say, some of you got to get into the harvest. You've got to share your faith. you got to pray for somebody. It might not work the first time. It might not work the tenth time. It might not work the hundredth time. But let it work one time. Let it work one time. Let it work one time. Watch what happens. Whoa! You gotta put, you gotta put legs to all this prayer. You gotta put legs to all this fasting. What's the purpose of all this prayer and this fasting and this revelation if we don't ever take it anywhere? I had, a, I had, I don't know if I'd call it a full vision, but it was like a kind of vision. Okay. I don't want to over spiritualize, but it was a kind of vision. It was last week of the missions conference or two weeks ago. And uh, we were praying and they were talking about reaching the world. And God gave me a kind of vision. I saw an image just for a split second. And how many know that person that, that works out really like religiously, you know? All right, right. Do I have any, I have any gym rats up in here? Luke. I need someone real buff though, not just kind of buff, you know? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Luke. I'm just kidding. Um, someone needs to be, I need a buff dude up in here. Come on, somebody. They're all so humble, ladies. That's what it is. They're all so humble. All right, all right, Josh. Come on up.
I had this vision. Oh, you come up here, sir. I had this vision of this massively buff individual, just like Brother Gomez. Massively buff, okay? He had, but the traps were like up here, okay? Listen, listen, I'm telling you, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm not just saying this to be funny. And everything up here, man, it was so squared away. We like to call those the show muscles, you know? The show muscles were intact. But quickly, my attention was shifted downwards, and I realized that this same vision, the same person, had skipped leg day. And he had these big buff muscles up top, but he had little skinny chicken legs on the bottom. Nothing like you, bro, nothing like you. And the Lord began to reveal to me, he says, this is what my people look like. He said, they've got the show muscles. They can talk about prayer, fasting, the four dimensions of prayer, dimensions of revelation, dimensions of burden and, and all. Man, they could articulate and articulate and articulate all these deep, wonderful principles. But none of them are teaching Bible studies. And no one are taking the revelation anywhere. No one's going out and, and reaching anybody. So what's the point of all these wonderful revelations if we don't ever share it with anyone? I'm, I'm done just preaching to the choir. I, I, I don't just want to preach to, to riled up saints every single week. We've got to have people getting the Holy Ghost and Lifeline every week. We've got to have 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 people getting the Holy Ghost. I'll never forget, Brother Nathaniel, you can play the piano. I'll never forget the first time I taught a Bible study and, and revelation came over the person's eyes. I'll never forget. I've taught a lot of Bible studies, quite a few in my life. Hundreds, literally, and, and I remember there was this one girl I was teaching her a Bible study, and I was teaching her on the oneness of God, and in the middle of that Bible study, I'm only about literally 40% through it, I could see the, the, the blinders taken off of her eyes, I could see it happen, I could physically see like cataracts falling from her eyes, and her eyes just opening, and her pupils dilating, and, and she says, I see it, I, I see it, I don't. You don't, she said, you don't even need to tell me anymore. I'll teach about the new birth, actually. I said, uh, uh, the essentiality of being baptized in Jesus' name. She said, I see it. You don't have to teach me anymore. She said, I want to get baptized right now. I don't even want to wait. I want to get baptized this very second. And, and we took her over to the baptistry, and we baptized her in Jesus' name. And she brought her friend the next week, and we, bought, we baptized her in Jesus' name. So, Brother Luke, can you please help me? Uh, I'm going to put our money where our mouth is. And... Uh, I'm going to invite everybody to stand tonight. Altar call is going to be a bit different. A bit different. Thank you, Brother Luke. And just, let's just take these, take these off. And just spread them out over the front. Okay? And someone can, Vince, can maybe help them. Thank you. I went to Sister Riddell in the bookstore. And I said, Sister Riddell, I want every Into His Marvelous Light Bible study you got. It's the, it's the most basic Bible study. It's just the plan of salvation. You can teach it in one session. I said, Sister Riddell, I want every single one you got. I'm going to buy you out. She said, I only got 50. I said, I want 100, Sister Riddell. She said, we're going to have to wait. All I got is 50. I said, can you rush order it? She said, no. <laughs> True story. She's a little nicer than that, though. But she's a lot nicer than that. And... Uh, I said, okay, I'll take 50, Sister Adele. Purchased every single one that she had. Because somebody this week, you've got to realize that you've got to stop just going back and forth with God in the cycle of sin, the cycle of addiction. And some of you have the lowest level relationship with God you could possibly have, which is repentance only. And repentance feels good. But you generally need to go a week or two to feel it again. Because you gotta kind of stack it up again, you know? You gotta put enough sin in the bank so it feels good again, you know? When he washes you and he cleanses you. But I'm telling you, God wants you to experience something so much deeper than repentance only. Repentance is wonderful. Maybe you need to repent tonight. There's lots of days I gotta repent. I still repent all the time. But my relationship with God is not repentance only. Sometimes I start praying for so y'all and God wakes me up at three in the morning and your names come to my mind and I got to start praying for you. And it's a little bit annoying that God woke me up for you at three in the morning. 
But then I start to see the fruit of my prayer and I start to see you do a little bit better. And I see you, you tarry to the, uh, in the altar a bit longer and, and I say, all right, that was worth it. Because there's something about seeing the power of God at work. For the Zoe, there's something about praying for a woman at Delta College. Some of you have never seen a healing before. I promise you, they happen all the time. When was the last time you prayed for someone to be healed? Teach someone a Bible. You don't, and I'm not telling you to win 100 people. I'm not telling you to, some people will do that. Some people that gifting. But just win one person and watch what it does to you. What's God completely change somebody's life from like alcoholic, drug addict, or just lost, depressed, wander through life? Watch them get filled with the Holy Ghost. There's a brother here. I'm not going to call him out, but there's a brother here. I saw him recently struggling with anxiety. Joy of the Lord's all over him. I'm telling you, I want everybody, I want everybody to experience that. Get your hand into the harvest. And, and it's not just the harvest. It's just as one example. Find out, God, what, what's my purpose? And you realize you may have the gift of health. And you start helping people. And you start caring for the elderly. And you start taking care of people who can't take care of themselves. And you start getting involved in ministry. And, or you start going to the deeper prayer meeting. And the power of intercession hits over you. And, and that burden comes over you. And you realize, man, this is why God, this is, this is what God wants me to do in life. And you connect yourself with your purpose. And I promise you, you'll connect yourself with your fulfillment. Every eye closed. Every eye closed. The, the title of the, the message tonight is Addicted to the Ministry. Now it's very important that you have the alignment correctly. You've got to walk with the Lord. You've got to have prayer time. In that prayer time, you start to receive a burden for what the Lord wants you to do. And then you go out and you do it. And you have to replace an addiction with another one. Instead of, you, it starts changing, right? Instead of scrolling aimlessly for hours and hours and hours, you say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get up and go knock a few doors. You said, that's crazy, nobody does that. A couple of guys did it the other day, Brother Luke, Brother Jude, just casually, middle of the day, hey, we got some free time. Let's go knock some doors for fun. Just for funsies, you know? They got three Bible studies out of it. I mean, and you start to realize, you know, or, or whatever, I'm gonna call somebody, or, you know, I've got some free time. Let me call somebody and just minister to them and, and pray over them. Or let me just crack this Bible open and read a couple more passages. And, and I'm not talking about listening to sermons because it's always eat, 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 eat. But I've learned if you eat all the time and you never work, that's how you get fat and it's how you get lazy. I'm not talking about sermon binging. I'm talking about doing something productive for the kingdom of God. And I've learned. When you've been working all day, you come to the house of God hungry. Hallelujah. When you've been working in the field all day, you come to the table ready to eat whatever the master is serving. And so, we'll do a couple altar calls. Um, we'll do probably three. What time is it? Oh, I'm way over time. I'm sorry. All right. Um, we're going to do it very quickly. So... If you've never taught a Bible study before, ever, you've never taught a Bible study before, and you feel a tug, if you don't feel a tug, that's okay. 
You should feel a tug when I'm talking about it. I know I need to be teaching Bible studies. God's been dealing with me about teaching Bible studies. And you've never taught a Bible study before. There's 50 of them down here. You're probably going to run out. I want you to run down only if you'll commit to teach this Bible study in the next 30 days. You may need to tell a coworker, hey, I made a commitment with God. You don't even have to listen or pay attention. I just got to keep my commitment to God, all right? Go to some homeless guy. I'll buy you McDouble if you listen to me teach this. Can you? But you're going to commit. You're not going to break it. But you're really going to be looking for somebody who's hungry in the next 30 days. You're going to teach this Bible study. It's, it can be taught in one lesson. You can just read it. It's really, this is why I bought it. It's the easiest Bible study to teach. If you're going to commit, only if you feel drawn by the Lord. I don't want you, if you don't feel drawn by the Lord, I want you to run down here and grab one of these Bible studies. You might need to come quick because I think they may all go. And if you grab one, just stay down here because we're going to pray together. We're going to pray together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, ladies, gentlemen. Anybody else? Never taught a Bible study before, but you want to. Thank you, Dominic. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, the ladies are gone. Gentlemen, anybody else? Anybody else, gentlemen? Thank you, Jesus. All right, gentlemen, we, got, we have a few left. If it's been a long time since you taught a Bible study and you want to teach another one, like you've You've taught one in the in the ancient history of life, but you know what? I need to teach another one. I need to, I feel a tug to teach another one. I want you to come and grab one. Thank you, gentlemen. Lots of you have been teaching Bible study. Let's get up for the men. Amen. All right. Now, second altar call is if you feel what I'm talking about, but you do not know what your purpose is, and you want God. Lord, show me what my purpose is in the kingdom. Lead me. What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to reach? I don't just want to live for myself. I want to live to serve your kingdom. And that's you. And I'm just a bit confused. I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what God wants me to do. There's nothing wrong with admitting that. But if that's you, just I want you to come down to the front. Thank you for coming. Amen. Come on. And if we could just all come on, gather around front. Gather close. Gather around close. Gather around close. We're going to pray. And I, I genuinely feel beyond my words. I'm not going to hype you up. I've prayed about it. And I believe it. God is going to hit you with the burden for what he wants you to do. And the final altar call I'll give is if you know what your purpose is. But you feel like you've been slacking. And you haven't been doing it. And you want to recommit. God, I'm going to serve your kingdom. I'm going to do what you're asking me to do. I'm going to do it with my whole heart. Would you join us at the altar tonight? Oh, I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. Hallelujah. Right now, God's going to drop a name into your mind right now. I want you to start praying for that person. God, develop a burden in me for them. Lord, I pray that I would see the fruit of my prayers. I pray that they'd be saved. I pray they'd experience what I experience. I pray they'd know the power of God. I pray they would know that you've got a plan for their life. Come on, that's it. Come on, that's it, the burden. I can feel it. It's stirring up. Let it stir up, ladies. Come on. Let it stir up, ladies. Let it stir up. Let it stir up. Let it stir up. I'll go wherever. I'll go wherever. I'll say whatever. I'll do whatever. God's got a purpose. He's got a plan.